This is Devin Foley, CEO of the Charlemagne Institute, and I'm excited to be opening another uh, episode of Back Channel. Today, our guest is C.J. Ingle, who wrote an article for this Chronicles, which you should subscribe to if you haven't already. You can do that. Uh, but C.J. is going to be uh, talking about his article, Up from Libertarianism, and uh, sort of the, the mental and probably spiritual path that he's been going down as far as moving away from that uh, sort of libertarian outlook on the world to turning to more things like tradition and what might be called old school conservatism or paleo conservatism. Uh, we're very excited for it. We are streaming to the Intellectual Takeout Facebook page, the Chronicles Facebook page, also streaming to the Charlemagne Institute's YouTube channel. And then of course, uh, on any of those platforms, if you have questions or you wanna be able to engage a little bit more, ask those questions, I will do my best to work them into the presentation. And if you don't want to engage with those platforms, just shoot an email to contact at charlemagneinstitute.org. So with that, I turn it over to CJ. CJ, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, tell us a little bit about the background between uh, libertarianism and sort of where you see yourself going now and sort of what are the differences? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. It's, it's good to be here. Um, I think, as I expressed in my article, um, one of the reasons that libertarianism kind of exploded um, in the 2008 time frame um, was just that there was a severe financial crisis and there was a uh, there was a pocket of, of younger people that were becoming disillusioned with all the narratives that had taken place in the post-Soviet era. Once we began to look inward, we began to judge what was happening, what was going on in the world by um, you know, a variety of different standards. You know, a lot of them were moral, some of them were economic, and we began to see, especially at the turn of the century, that perhaps having an imperial foreign policy was not something that was actually good for our economic stability and our and the continuity of our of you know American uh, heritage. Um, and, you know, once we begin to look into ourselves, and we heard um, the one of the greatest dissenters of the modern age, which would be Ron Paul. And he kind of set off this willingness to disengage with the establishment, to reject both the um, establishment as it presented itself in the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, and to look for alternatives. Um, it, be, it, it was realized that these two options were actually not that far apart, and that they were two sides of a framework that were selling to different constituencies and demographics, basically the same establishmentarian outlook on the world be dressed up in different phrases and different uh, narratives and you know it, it was an opportunity for young people to recognize that perhaps what we were being sold was not something that we wanted to have anything to do with and therefore libertarianism kind of provided itself an opportunity um, for a moral indictment against the against the state against the you know the federal government and all of its mechanisms and um, shenanigans going on, not only domestically, but internationally. Um, and so libertarianism was kind of a third way option. And socialism was seen as something that wasn't very attractive because of its recent failures. And so libertarianism was kind of the heir of this classical liberal paradigm that we had been sold throughout the 20th century. And I think it became popular because of the failure of the establishment you know, that was becoming increasingly obvious from 2000 to 2008. And when the financial collapse happened, it was recognized that changes were needed, that we needed to go back and rethink, rethink some things. And libertarianism offered um, an entire framework of tools to indict a class of people that had basically betrayed the American civil life. And so once that offered itself and you know when you have people like myself that are looking for a framework that is consistent that is um that you can treat principally you can't treat with with principles and you can apply that to the enemy that we now saw was the enemy the establishment and it's something that you can um morph into a consistent body of propositions that you can apply to almost any political behavior and it's so easy for someone coming to learn about libertarianism to apply it to a system that has bankrupted uh, our way of life. And so it was a very attractive moment. Um, but unfortunately, in the post Ron Paul era, it kind of fell apart. 
And, you know, right now, as as a movement, not necessarily as an ideology, but as a movement, it's in complete shambles, uh, bickering, disagreements, fighting, strife. Nobody gets along. And it provided an opportunity um, for us to go back and question, why did it fail at all? What what was it about libertarianism that basically uh, did not allow it to have any staying power at all? You know, what, why didn't this uh, this ideology that could critique, um, you know, one of the biggest government in world history. Why is it that this ideology only lasted for a few years before it kind of fell into shambles? Um, once you begin to question that, I think it provides, uh, it, you know, it, it it disengages your mind from the psychological hold that you know the the perfection of its ideology had. And once you're disengaged from that, you can go back and look at it objectively and recognize the extent to which it is, um, you know, not consistent with, you know, there's a reason why history, uh, you know, history developed as it did, and that libertarianism was never really seen as something that could be uh, politically advantageous for the protection and advancement of, of, you know, certain interests. So I think, I think once it fell apart, it allowed, it allowed people to go back and question it and recognize that perhaps, you know, a perfect rationalistic body of propositions that make up a political theory isn't really what political movements should be about. And I think that was kind of when it broke and began, we began to have the opportunity to go back and question uh, its nature and you know the extent to which it's even applicable in political life. Fascinating. There's so many uh, points that I would like to, to take out of that. Uh, you know, looking back on the Ron Paul years and others, you know, it strikes me that if I was to name two or three of the biggest issues that drove uh, libertarianism, it would be that financial crisis. But before that, the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war, uh, senseless blood loss. I mean, for all of us who had friends that were over there and were wounded or scarred, uh, all manner of things, that that was a catalyst. Uh, and we saw libertarianism as, as, as you say, an ideology with welcoming arms. What would you say to uh, going into more detail as far as why it fell apart and what you see as needed for a successful political movement? What would you say, you know, when you look at the people that uh, have lost faith in libertarianism but are still searching, what is it that is driving people? What is it that what is this innate desire that people are hungering for that they had hoped libertarian answers, but it didn't. And now they're still they're on to, you know, a new search, if you would. What is that desire? You know, I think one of the biggest aspects to answer this question is the fact that society isn't built on people coming to rational conclusions. It's not built on, you know, pure, people don't sit back and philosophize about the way they want to live. Most people don't. I mean, there is this always going to be a chunk of people that do, um, you know, the sort of the philosoph you know, philosophically inclined, but I don't think most people think about things like that. They just want normal life. They want to preserve and protect their, you know, habits and their conventions and their traditions. And what happens when you when you attempt to radicalize people and when you attempt to, um, you know, f give them a collection of propositions that they need to agree to and build a movement around those, you begin to um, you begin to tear people apart from the things that actually make civil life possible, which is not, um, you know, ideological constructs at all. So as true as I think, you know, a lot of these ideologies can be, and I think they are helpful, I think philosophy is needed for the guidance of you know civil society i don't think you can build a movement based on pure rationalization I, I don't think that you can have something that serves the needs of you know regular mass men i don't think that that families can come together based on ideology i think people find meaning and significance in custom in traditions in their own cultural memories in a way that ideology can not only um, fail to serve, but actually can undermine, you know, a lot of those needs. You know, if you look at European history for, you know, over a thousand years, it, there was a lot of continuity. I think continuity would be, a, would be a major theme, you know, the adherence to custom, the passing on of traditions and the ways of doing things. But what happens is 
when you tell people to reject those in favor of an ideology, you begin to create strife and you begin to create tensions. You begin to tear apart the fabric of this organic, natural, underlying society. And then it becomes a war of ideology, a war over the mind. And people that were formerly naturally together in a, in a fabric, you know, in a nexus of relationships, um, you begin to tear that apart and then ideology can't heal it. It's not a band-aid that you can just place over it. It actually serves as a weapon for political power and turns back on the people that you were trying to bring into freedom and enslaves them. Um, you know, and I think one of the main reasons that it fell apart is you can't create a lasting staying society on a collection of propositions because most people don't think that way. I mean, the idea that you can go back to your grandparents and all of the ways that they interacted with each other and the customs that they have and told them to adhere to this body of propositions, I think is completely ludicrous. And I think that is the, the impetus for unleashing totalitarianism because you can rock the, the social boat in such a way as people kind of forget their heritage, they forget their customs, and they instead pursue this ideology that ends up servicing, uh, you know, whatever totalitarian regime is able to take advantage of that. That's no, fascinating. I mean, in one way, uh, you know, if you look at libertarianism, distill it, it is that the individual is the foundation of society. And it is a set of parameters that radicalizes individuality. And in some ways, you might be able to, you can argue that that very tenant and goal of it is its own unraveling in some ways. And furthermore, as you're pointing out that people don't live in reason, uh, that's almost as if you're condemning, you know, much of the Enlightenment and things, you know, an age that seems to be coming to an end as postmodernism and the rejection of objective truths and reason uh, to be able to determine those truths is seems to be taking root in a very rapid fashion. But what would you say to those ideas? Well, first of all, I, I would say that, um, you know, the, the case against, you know, liberal modernism is not a case against objective truth, but it is a case against pretending like civil society is built on ideas in a way that uh, libertarians want it to be. You know, I think that ideas do drive history. I, I do adhere to that, you know, um, you know, philosophy of history, but I don't think that, you know, the majority of people operate themselves and um, build coalitions on the basis of pure intellectualism. I, I don't think that's a reasonable assumption about the nature of sociological institutions at all. And so I, I do see this has kind of been termed the age of ideology. You know, it's this, it's this battle of ideology and pretending like you, everyone thinks that their view of the world is the correct one, but pretending like um, your view of the world is going to be the one that's established, I think is a, a very dangerous idea moving forward. I think when you have a battle of ideas, the risk of losing it out to um, you know, more sinister ideas is much greater than continuity. And this is one of the things that you know, the, the founder of modern conservatism, you know, it would be Edmund Burke in his case against the French Revolution. One of the things that he pointed out was you can be surely convinced that your body, your ideology, your body of propositions is true and that it would lead to utopia. But if you go down the path of unraveling history and implementing your uh, ideology, what's going to happen is inevitably is you're going to fail in instituting it and you're going to open up the door for something much more sinister than the very thing that you're trying to uh, you know, break yourself free from. And so, you know, a lot of these French revolutionaries and Tom Paine would be, you know, one of these types of pro French revolutionary spirit type people. One of the things that Burke said is that in pursuing your utopian goals, you're going to unleash, um, you know, the, the true spirit of man without the constraints that history has provided for him. 
And so it wasn't that, you know, Rousseau and Payne didn't have some something that would be attractive if we were just sitting down and creating a blueprint of society. Uh, you know, maybe we could we construct something that would be completely wonderful to have. The problem is, is that failing to achieve that utopia would bring us inevitably, inevitably to something like the Soviet Union. And it wouldn't and, and its failure to implement your utopia would actually bring about something that was much worse than any imperfections that could be perceived in the ancient regime, you know, of, of France, you know, Germany, continental Europe, and of course, you know, in England, in the Anglosphere. So I think having that more realistic view of man and the dangers and, you know, the extent to which man can implement something that is fierce and totalitarian is something that the realist conservative tradition warned about long before the rise of the Bolsheviks, uh, you know, as far back as the French Revolution. And I think the Bolsheviks and the Stalinist experiment were something that came about because Burkean warnings were not heeded. When you're looking at all of that, it seems to me that there is a sort of a desire for an easy ideology to be adopted these days. When you look at even uh, the issue of uh, Black Lives Matter and Antifa and others, and you find a lot of uh, ideology mixed in with emotional impulses. It seems to me that the, the, the fundamental problem with ideology is that it is a rejection or an unwillingness to grapple with the real nature of man. The, the fact that you have both good and evil uh, abilities within you and that that evil can be, as you say, unleashed in a surprisingly horrific manner. Uh, as far as moving towards that, where, where do you find yourself now? Uh, you know, having left libertarianism behind and seemingly tossed aside uh, the, you know, the siren song of ideology, what, where are you going now? What books, what has led you down this path? Yeah, what has led me down this path? I think that's a good question. Um, and for any libertarians um, watching this, the type of libertarian that I was, the background, you know, had very much to do with the with the you know Murray Rothbard and Hans Hoppe type libertarianism, and I, I when I when you're when you have a body of political theory, and you're someone like me, in order to leave it, you can't re just reject it categorically. You have to find a problem with it. And that's what I had to do in order to leave it, because I don't want to take something that I'm convinced is true and just all of a sudden decide that I don't care about its, you know, its its true nature and then just walk away because I desire something else. So, so now, CJ, when you're looking at that, are you saying that and this goes back to the discussion about reason and other things? I mean, you're looking at libertarianism, you start to see its flaws. But was it but at the same time, your mind is wanting to tell you that it's true. And so where does where does the impulse, if you would, to move away from the ideology come? Is it intellectual first or is it sort of a gut feeling that this isn't working or not realistic or, you know, any number of other issues? I think the gut feeling for me came first, but then I had to go back and prove it because I had I had I had rested on it for 10 years. You know, I had to go back and prove it to myself to make sure that I wasn't just chasing impulses. But the impulse definitely came first. I, you know, I, I came to a place where I was just completely tired and aggravated with even dealing with libertarian movement and, and the brand, you know, the, the name that, you know, the, the leading lights of libertarian, not like not like Tom Woods or, you know, the Mises Institute or anyone like that, but the Libertarian Party, you know, the, the face of libertarianism in the public sphere was just horrific and embarrassing, you know, and, and it's like it's it's one of those things where, you know, you, at the last days of your libertarianism, you know, you are one, but you can't admit it in public, um, you know, just because it's just a humiliating label to put on yourself. So that that's the impulse that comes first. There's an essay by Richard Weaver, uh, 1958, I think it was published in Modern Age. Uh, it's called Up From Liber Up From Liberalism. And it was it's basically, you know, Weaver recollecting his 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 development over time in his 20s. He was a socialist. Right. Just like Friedrich Hayek and a lot of other classical liberals, um, you know, the age of ideology was born in a clash between liberalism and socialism. And a lot of these people were socialists. You know, they had kind of 
understood that socialism, even a lot of libertarians don't understand that socialism is extremely intellectually attractive. If, you know, if, if you start at the root, it's base propositions and build up from there. It does claim to be a rational, internally consistent body of political thought. Um, and so Richard Weaver has that type of mind that's attracted to systems. And so he was attracted to socialism, but he tells the tale of his coming away from uh, liberalism or excuse me, from socialism on his way first to liberalism and then to traditionalism. But when he was falling away from socialism, he realized that he first became frustrated with the type of people that he was having to work with. And he realized that it would be a completely insane choice to sacrifice a rational world or excuse me, an irrational world in which you liked everyone. You had friends and family, you had customs and habits in common to give that up for a completely rational world in which everyone was unbearable. So this was, he realized that that was a stupid trade to make. And therefore, the case to be made for a political position is on who you're going to deal with on the other side, right? So this was Weaver's experience, and that struck my heart like a, like a spear. And he, he expressed the fact that he was 29 when he let go of his socialism and kind of came into this more realistic state of mind at the age of 30, ready to start over and start from scratch. And I turned 30 in a month and I realized that, you know, I, I had gone down that same journey, except for, uh, you know, I'm not coming away from the ideology of socialism. I'm coming away from the ideology of libertarianism. So yes, the impulse came first, but then I had to go back and prove it. And the way I did that was sort of a combination between Hans Hoppe um, and Edmund Burke. And Hans Hoppe has this great book called Democracy, the God that Failed. And in that book, he has an essay on the relationship between conservatism, sort of this sociological conservatism um, that is consistent with paleoconservatism and his own libertarian, you know, rationalistic. And, and while Hans Hoppe still considers himself a libertarian, I realized that his entire construction of civil society going back to the dark ages was basically this dark, and to use a word from Burke, inscrutable set of relations between um, you know, parents and community elders and even um, you know, arist the aristocrats and then even kings who basically define the terms and conditions of living within their private property order. And so anyone born into that order can't just declare himself an independent person who has all these rights that he can force back against this, this construct, this, this, this nexus of hierarchies and uh, a mixture of duties and rights. You can't just declare yourself independent from that. Um, and, and, you know, and call yourself a, you know, an upstanding member of that social order. And once you realize that all of European history developed like this, and that even at the time of the French Revolution in the 18th century, you realize that Burke was the one that was more accurately describing the development of history, and therefore rights and duties are something that come to us in a package, and you can't just pick and choose what you want and unwind history in order to um, achieve your utopia. So I found a consistency between the libertarianism of Hans Hoppe and the conservative tradition of Edmund Burke, and from Burke, you go to Kirk, and you can even go to the continental uh, you know, right-wing uh, type, uh, you know, philo philosophers, and you can embrace a type of traditionalism that I think is much more meaningful, and I think is much more needed in our age of upheaval and chaos. Now, we had talked a little bit before the show actually started, and uh, you said that you were the oldest of six kids, and then you also, uh, you grew up homeschooled, and then you also now have kids yourself and homeschool. Out of curiosity, I mean, I have six kids and was raised as an only child and or just grew up not raised as one. It wasn't some secret person tucked in the corner, but, uh, you know, grew up with that. And now I have six kids and we homeschool. What did sort of raising a family play any role in shaping your, you know, that gut sense? And then did it, you know, what did you learn? Did it have an impact? How did that play out, if at all? I don't think for me it did, but I think for the typical libertarian, I think it would definitely play a role because I think there's a general libertarian spirit, which is that 
you get to define your destiny and meaning meaning in the universe you know that um you know the ability to act morally is kind of up to you your purpose in the civil order is is all on you and that anyone that tries to force their idea not even force but just tries to influence you in a direction that they see as more advantageous for you is kind of um, at odds with the general libertarian spirit. I never kind of, I never came from that. I've always had a very conservative demeanor about me. I've, I've always been someone that's not very rebellious. I'm, I'm fiercely loyal to the way my parents raised me. Um, so I never fell for that. So in me personally, I don't think it did, but that also made me completely unique in the libertarian universe. Right. So I think for the typical libertarian having kids and seeing them as, um, as individuals that need to be taught where to go, you know, they're not people that that just need to be thrown out into the wild and they get to choose their own way. But they're actually some people, they're individuals that that whose minds need to be crafted and shaped in a certain direction. This is very much against the modern spirit that pervades not only libertarianism, but just liberalism and progressivism in general. I don't see my kids as um, as as people that that get to just um, you know, live their life independent of me. I, my responsibility and my role in their life is to, um, help them construct a proper view of the world. You know, it's, it's, there's a very propagandistic nature to parenthood. And I don't, and I don't think I ever fell away from that, but if anything, the embrace of traditionalism has made me embrace that and appreciate that role even more. My job in their life is to not to just reinforce this liberal mindset that they get to do whatever they want and there's no everything's neutral there's no right and wrong way but in in actuality i'm supposed to give them you know a, a vision of the world to use you know a phrase from richard weaver a metaphysical dream a starting point from which they can interpret the world properly there is an objective truth there isn't an, an objective metaphysical framework uh, by which they should approach the world and unfortunately the world as it is is hostile to that traditionalist metaphysical dream. And therefore, not only am I giving them um, the tools to interpret the world, but I'm also giving them the tools to fight back and defend themselves and their old world vision from this sort of wig under, you know, this wiggish understanding of history as progressive development, always getting better, always, uh, you know, the, 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 the current year is always more enlightened than previous decades, etc. And so, so yeah, it's made me appreciate it more. And maybe that's maybe that's kind of the reactionary spirit that I have in me, you know, that that all the all the narratives and all the constructs and all the claims of the 20th century need to be repudiated, pushed back against, and there needs to be a wall of defense against those things. And so, yes, I'm very much a traditionalist. I felt like I was already in that direction as a libertarian, but now I don't have anything holding me back, you know, so to speak. So Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I just I was surprised after so many years of homeschooling, you know, I, already coming from an only child background, you know, you're kind of a lone wolf anyway. And so that radicalized individualism is a natural home for yourself. But the thing that struck me the most about the homeschooling is just how family life is uh, when you homeschool, that you're with the kids all the time. And that that really isn't very, that is actually in line with human history up until very recently, that the family was an economic union, a unit, but also just a cultural unit and everything else that surrounded and, and protected the child, raised them up, but it also had duties of its own. And it just, through homeschooling, that, that comes very clearly. Uh, now, as far as you were homeschooled. Usually, uh, a lot of people that are homeschooling, especially in California, they're coming from a you know a Christian background. I don't know your background at all, but does religion uh, play a role for you, or and did it play a role within sort of that gut sense? Yeah, I think religion played a key role both in my entry to libertarianism and in my exit. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I, I kind of have a very refined understanding of libertarianism where it's very um, politically oriented, where, it, you know, the, the spirit of the meaning of libertarianism is not about individuals doing whatever they want, but it's merely about the state being unallowed to 
uh, you know, uh, coerce, you know, ag- or aggress against the, you know, the person or property of an individual. That's kind of the this the, the refined, pure definition of libertarianism. So it was never for me about the individual not having family duties, you know, familial duties, but it was mostly about the state having zero role in um, decisions that should be made purely by the property owner without any other coercive influence. Right. Um, I think there is a long Christian tradition to the idea that the state has a sphere that it needs to stay within. I think that Christianity um, did have a role in uh, separating the um, the state from you know society. And so I, I think that I, I did take that and basically refine it down to, you know, uh, you know, perfect definitions in a way that allowed me to be both a libertarian from my Christian, you know, your heritage. So yes, I did grow up Christian, but on, th- but then at the same time, um, you know, Christianity also led me out because I realized that history has religious meaning to it and that all of world history is kind of the development of human societies in a way that, um, you know, it's, it's consistent with, you know, the, the Christian message and that we were given political leaders and that political leaders are part of a hierarchical society for the stability and to prevent the unleashing of ideology and other you know threats to stable order. And so I did kind of see Christianity as playing a role in my entry in and as well as my entry out. Um, so I've, I've never really backed away from that side of things. But of course, you know, you're seeing where the world is now, and having zero interest in the libertarian movement at large, you know, Christianity becomes to mean much more to you in a world that lacks meaning, in a world that's kind of defined by your ability to consume and your ability to achieve material status. I think religion is going to play a big role in surviving the sort of left-wing totalitarianism that's developing. Uh, you know, we all see it. So Right. Well, and, you know, when you look at ideology, ideology is very much uh, that they have religious characteristics to it almost more so than just uh you know christian tenets and beliefs and things of that nature i mean some private property for libertarians is sacrosanct i mean there there is no justification for the violation of private property in most cases unless the person has done something to violate and yada 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 but it's elevated up there and and you see it too in some of the libertarian discussions uh, you know, economic freedom is kind of the highest end of society. But you're talking a lot about family, tradition, things of na- that nature. How does it work going forward? How do you apply the traditionalism and sort of the paleoconservative, old school conservatism to the present situation? One of the things that I've learned in my transformation is the extent to which we need to embrace particularity that we can anybody can sit down and they can construct their ideal you know whether it's this anarchist utopia or whether that's it's this medieval caste system anyone can get together and put on paper what they think is the best way to you know the best thing to pursue but one of the things that i've really begin to appreciate is the need for particularity there are particular needs at particular times for particular people and so the solution in the 19th century is not the same as what we need to pursue right now in this moment we're not see liberalism came to be in a way that unraveled christendom Right. It unraveled and it sought the neutralization of values and the state was supposed to be neutral on morals. It was supposed to let the individual decide which way he wanted to go. Liberalism was that construct that lasted from the French Revolution to maybe you could call it the progressive era and the progressive era era you know, kind of transformed into what James Burnham called the managerial revolution into a complete takeover of the liberal state. And this is something that was predicted by critics of liberalism. And I, too, come to the top of my head immediately. One is Carl Schmitt, the great German jurist, and the other is Antonio Gramsci, who was a cultural Marxist, the founder of cultural Marxism, uh, the Italian. Both of them were critics of liberalism, not because they didn't appreciate um, what liberalism was trying to do, but that liberalism by its very nature did not include the means to prevent its own takeover. And so liberalism was always a transitory phenomenon. It was always something that was going to be appealed to 
on the way on the way from Christendom and on the way to whatever comes next. So liberalism kind of opened the chasm for someone to take over. Who was going to take it over? That was the great debate in the 20th century is who was going to take over the liberal neutral order. Liberalism does not have any tools in its tool belt to prevent either the far right or the far left from taking over. They can't do it. And so what we see standing here in 2020 is that the left uh, achieved the left achieved victory. It was to the triumphant class. It. I have an article coming out in Chronicles um, shortly, hopefully on the blog. Maybe it's going to be in the magazine. I'm still talking about that. But it's called the radicalization of the bourgeois neighbor. And the fight was always over the middle class, whose ideology was going to reign supreme and capturing the middle class and, and utilizing it for the sake of power. And so uh, leftism won. The progressive worldview kind of gave way to the radical left. And liberal, liberalism was always a transitory thing. And so we, as you know, proponents of Christ, Christendom, as critics of the liberal order, we can say we want to go back, but we have to recognize that liberalism was the thing on the way to where we're going now. Yeah. Right. So so what do we do? Do we just, you know, all of a sudden vote people into office that will bring us back to what we want? I don't think that's possible. I actually think that it's completely taken over. And the only way forward is to be illiberal. You know, the only way to be realistic about it. I think something like Franco needs to take control for a certain amount of time and um, understand that the nature of politics is about the the conflict between enemies. I think that is the nature of politics. I don't think liberalism likes that rhetoric, but I think that's one of the things I learned from people like Carl Schmitt, especially through the interpretation of Paul Gottfried, is the nature of politics as the clash of enemies um, for victory. And I think that the, the conservatives in America have been liberalized so that the left can radicalize and take over the liberal. They've been kind of, you know, the conservative movement has been neutralized. They're kind of numb. They don't have any effect on anything. All they have is the appeal to liberalism. And the progr the far left appeals to liberalism in a way that brings it away from our traditions and toward wherever they want to go. So the only way to fight the left is to become an enemy of the left. It is to embrace the right. You can't You can't embrace liberalism because the left has conquered it. Right. So the answer to your question is particular needs for particular moments in time. And I do think sort of a return of the strong gods, to use R.R. R. Reno's uh, phrase, I think is is our necessary particular condition at this moment. It's a thought that is being discussed by a lot of people. I know, uh, you know, if you think about the republic and the government that we have, the constitutional order, uh, we always say we're a self-governing nation, but governing this. Governing a nation and self-governing start with actually governing the self. And as we look at the breakdown of society, for instance, here in St. Paul, you have an almost 90% out of wedlock birth rate for African-Americans, native born. And then you have about a 30% out of wedlock birth rate for whites. Uh, that family breakdown is very real and has very, very real implications for it and for the nation, for the country, for the formation of people, for spiritual, mental health, all of these things. I have wondered, and this gets to, to this issue of how do we battle it, how do you teach people to re-embrace family, to be parents, to actually be a biological mother and father taking charge of their children versus what we have now, the shattering of, of the family and the foundation of society. How do we do these things in a constitutional liberal structure? It seems to me that it can't be done because everything, as you say, is secularized. Everything's supposed to be neutral. There's not supposed to be uh, moral beliefs behind anything or these ideas. So how do you, how do you approach these things? I don't I don't think it's really possible to do it in an organic way anymore. I, I think that once you have I mean, it, it, you know, having an organic strategy was something that the, the new left, you know, the post 1950s left kind of had in their arsenal to transform um, the Western system. I think they've taken it over. I, I don't think you can just you know, tell people to go raise a family and teach. A, I mean, those are great things. Those are those are necessary things in order in order to 
um, you know, provide the next generation with the uh, mental fortitude, the intellectual fortitude to survive the, you know, the the very you know overbearing and burdensome, um, you know, liberal framework, or leftist frameworks that are being perpetrated throughout society. But I don't think that in itself is going to do anything beyond survival. I don't think it's going to help us recapture anything meaningful. All the institutions, everybody will be, I mean, when you have this managerial system where everything, all capital flows from the top and everything's controlled in James Burnham's managerial society, and we become poorer because of that, we become more enslaved to debt all the education systems have been taken over and radicalized there you know to the extent that you could call the church is still existing it's been completely taken over and radicalized so where are the institutions that are going to help um you know help uh, nurture the family they don't exist so the family is in survival mode but in terms of actually fighting back against the left i think you have to look to the institutions and you have to be willing to capture them in a way that's not um that's not necessarily nice that's 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 at odds with the liberal uh rhetoric you know you have to make a decision there's no neutrality educational institutions are being tasked to teach kids everything from you know sexual education to science there's that's not those aren't neutral topics that they're they're talking about they are propagating a certain view of the world and in order to fight back against it they have to be captured and you have to reorient them in the direction that you want to go and i don't think there's it's any i don't think it's possible to do it without capturing power and and capturing the institutions no i think that's uh it's a logical end to the problem that we see. And, you know, part of this, you know, one of my awakenings was the realization that there is no values neutral government. There is no values neutral education. There is no values neutral anything, really. You're always making a choice based upon your values. And so that brings us to the point then as far as what as a lot of younger, you know, under 45, under 40 Americans are making this transition because you are not alone. Uh, I, I mean, I've done the transition. Several people on staff have done the transition, and I'm seeing more and more people go to that. But as you describe this, we're up against ideology. Is Christendom the only answer to that ideology? You know, if you look for what are you rallying around, I can be honest, I've spent enough time raising money and other things. I'm not dying for capitalism, I'm not going to die for that, but I'll die for my family. I'll die for my beliefs, my religion, and all of these things. And so is, is that the rallying point that people have to arrive at? I, I do think that, um, you know, and there's a good, good interview um, years back by, by, um, with Pat Buchanan, I, I can't remember the year must've been 10 years ago with Pat Buchanan. And, um, they asked him, you know, what we, you know, what would it take to get another Thomas Jefferson, right? Some, someone that would be, you know, to work in pursuit of liber liberty in, a, in an effective manner and basically oppose the left in a sting way. And Pat Buchanan just answered that we don't, we're at a point in history where we don't need another Thomas Jefferson so much as we need a St. Paul. And his, I think, I think that's the right approach. I don't, I mean, you, we can come up with solutions, temporary solutions that could counter the left, but you know, I personally don't see a way out. I don't see a, a, anything that could unite the people at a metaphysical level beyond something that speaks to the metaphysical, you know? And when you think about the development of Christian doctrine in you know, in, you know, the, the middle, the, the, the dark ages, so to speak, the dark ages, you see them as wrestling with this medica metaphysical vision of the meaning of God. It's a very ontological debate. And there was a lot at stake and people today don't realize how much at stake there was in the very foundational principle of your metaphysical vision of the world. And then, so, yes, I think ultimately the only thing that could have staying power, the only thing that could last from the collapse of Rome in the 400s to the French Revolution was something that you, was uniting the people at a very basic metaphysical level, which was, um, you know, the Christian view of the world and the universe and time and, you know, and things at that level. So the answer is yes. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't temporary things we can do, temporary coalitions um, with people on the right that are not 
uh, that don't think about the role of Christianity in that way. But ultimately, I don't think anything is going to have staying power unless it gets to the very base of worldview, which is which is you know which which the Christian tradition does provide. There's a sort of irony to this in the sense that, to your point, the liberal tradition was hijacked and doesn't have the ability to defend itself because of the various principles that it has, and particularly due to secularism. The cultural Marxists that we're up against, I think, in many ways, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, but it seems that they've forced the issue of values that in their total war, their total culture war, they leave no stone unturned as far as how anything and everything should be changed to align itself with their ideology and uh, and those beliefs. What I've also found interesting, though, which is popping up now, and I'm wondering if this those very same tendencies of the cultural Marxists as far as opening things up and forcing people to grapple with every little part of their life and the values involved in it. But what's interesting too now is you're seeing Black Lives Matter leadership uh, turning to the occult for power and being very open about it as far as, you know, they, I don't know if too many people are aware of this, but that whole save his name business, uh, you know, say his name, say his name, that's actually part of an occult practice that had already taken place earlier in the day or previous night that was attempting to unleash the power of that person who'd passed away, uh, George Floyd being an example, and to to gain spiritual power by that. Do you see a turn towards religion in all areas, a turning back to a traditional Christianity, but also might we see the rise of paganism again uh, to fill the void that's been left by liberalism? Yes, I think, I think you know, I, I adhere to, uh, you know, a traditional Christian understanding of the meaning of history. You know, and when you look at great works of Christendom, like you know, the city of God, you know, Augustine's city of God, you realize that there's a, there's a meta, there's a, um, a meta narrative in history, this cosmic conflict between, you know, the good and the evil, the darkness and the light, Michael, you know, the angel, archangel, Michael and Satan. And I do think that there's a cosmic layer behind and underneath everything that happens in our physical lives. And I think that has, is true going back to the ancient Egyptians even further back to the Assyrians, it's it's long been this you know you know um, this this pagan universe, had, you know morphed into the triumphant Christ who who broke this logos who broke into the world at that time and redeclared himself in a cosmic way, and the development of Christendom from that was the declaration that the ultimate reality was you know Christ and His kingdom. And so I think that as that loses its force in society, I don't think there's any other way to see this unleashing of a demonically rooted paganism to come back and um, reassert itself in world history as the, you know, the metaphysical grounding for all of these ideologies and revolutions and cultural upheavals and so on. So, I, yes, I think I think at root Marxism was essentially evil in a cosmic spiritual sense. And I do think that the French Revolution was the same. And I do think the Bolshevik Revolution was the same. And I do think the post-1968 New Left is the same. And I think everything that's happening today with Antifa and BLM is that same dark versus light cosmic struggle that's betraying itself. And so, yes, I do think that people are going to look to something beyond the material, something beyond materialism and the economic progress that we claim was the end of history is going to reveal itself as being completely empty and in need of a replacement. And I think that we're going to go back to something that has, um, you know, a metaphysical significance. And so I don't, I'm not, I'm not optimistic in the short term about the prospects for the Christian view of things, but I do think that it's going to make uh, the church kind of um, have to make a decision about what it really stands for. And so I think that spiritual significance is going to reassert itself in a very forceful way over the next decade. Sort of the rallying point for people who are moving towards, you know, tradition uh, to 
paleoconservatism, uh, you know, and, and uh, looking at things through a more religious uh, framework. Going and building upon the question of Christendom, what is the name? What is the label? You know, people people want to have a unifying, you know, nomenclature that they can say, yeah, I'm a part of this, and it's easy to identify each other. And to your point right now, a lot of people don't really want to uh, identify themselves as conservatives, and fewer people want to identify themselves as libertarians. <laughs> what, what what would you say is, uh, you know, the potential banner that people of our ilk are joining together under? Is it Christendom or is it something else? You know, I think I think that's the dilemma of where we find ourselves. Um, you know, during the French Revolution at the 18th century, those who were against the revolution and when I say revolution, I mean that in a broad world you know, world significant way, the revolution, the, the revolt against, um, you know, Christ as the center of the metaphysical universe. Um, so they had something that was on their, in their memory that they could appeal to and find unity in. I don't know that there's enough of that in order to unify, unify the reaction against the left in that way anymore. Unfortunately, we're going to have to go through a scenario that the East went through. When you look at Eastern Europe and Central Europe and anyone that was on the Soviet side of the, of the, you know, the wall that split the East and the West, when you look at what they went through, they had a time of um, purifying suffering. You know, they went through something where the only thing that they could do for survival was to seek out memory that they had lost. And so I don't think the West is going to be able to recapture the vision of the world that led to its, you know, triumphant, you know, accomplishments, I don't think we're going to be able to return to that unless we're purified. I think that there's a lot of fool's gold in the West. There's a lot of claims about the way we think about, um, the, you know, the glories of our history that are just simply not true. And you need to separate the wheat from the chaff in a, in a way that, that physically and mentally, psychologically and spiritually drains you. And once that happens, then you can recapture the vision of the world. So when we ask about what to do, I do think that we're in survival mode, and I do think that the suffering has to come before the reassertion of a proper view of the world. I don't think there's any other way. I don't think there's a saving the West from the totalitarianism that's already here. I think I think we have to lose ourselves to it in order to redefine um, who we are and rediscover and reassert um, a, a world that is already dead. You know, to be honest, that's kind of my pessimistic take. It's not good for fundraising, but that's that's kind of, the, you know, my impulse right now is is that survival mode, which is why, you know, the start of it is going to be having multiple children and educating them and helping them to remember the things that my parents in a you know figurative way lost for us. It's uh, you follow right along my thinking as well, which sorry to depress everyone out there, but. <laughs> There's yeah. also glory in it. So there's glory uh, in the fight. I think that is. people, you know, I don't think I think that there's a certain um, I think we need to have sort of a, a chivalrous, you know, mentality where we fight not for victory, but for the sake of the fight and for the sake of other people looking back at our loss as something that's significant and motivating to them. You know, Richard Weaver, um, I think it's an ideas have consequences. By the way, I quote him a lot because he's been, meant the most to me on my journey. But um, and I hate that word, my journey. But Richard Richard Weaver has this line where he talks about the need to understand lost causes, you know, and coming from someone who had a great appreciation for the South, he was someone who was close to lost causes. And I think studying Robert E. Lee, I think studying Stonewall Jackson, people that uh, you know fought and died for what they believed in, even no matter what side you take on the Civil War, um, I think studying what they thought they were fighting for can have a motivating spirit in the age to come. So look at people like Lee and people who lost in the South. Look in Germany, read Ernst Jünger, you know, read people who lost uh, the German heritage to the rise of liberalism and leftism. Read Solzhenitsyn and the, the loss of Russian identity in the Soviets. It's important to identify with lost causes and to um, find a spiritual victory in the coming political loss of the West. Bitter and sweet. It is bitter uh, and, and sweet, you know, that, yeah. 
Yeah, I think too. It's uh, those of us with kids who are having big families. A lot of people, most families that we associate with, all have four, five, six, seven, eight kids. And it seems that with a larger family, you're really uh, acutely aware of the responsibility that you have, but also that the future uh, that could be facing our kids. You know, I look at my two year old son and i just wonder you know what does the world look like when he's my age in 40 years and that's uh it's not exactly a happy picture at the same time it does give us energy uh and perspective to be able to try and prepare him as best as possible for whatever may come be interesting to see how it all develops so uh cj we're coming up at the top of the hour but could you just uh, give a few books that you would highly recommend to uh, either those who are in the libertarian camp who are intrigued by what you're saying or those who are uh, have already broken through and are going through the process but who are still pursuing truth? Yeah, I think there's a book by um, – I think it's pronounced Yuval Levin um, called The Great Debate. It's the, the the birth of left and right, and it's basically a contrast between Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine, and uh, as representatives of a of a greater political struggle, the meaning of political change. Um, I don't agree with Levin on everything. I'm, I'm probably a little bit more quote unquote reactionary than he is, um, but that book was was very pinnacle in in my transition and understanding the role of rational ideology and the role of realistic. Uh, continuity, you know, in the in in understanding, how, you know, the, in light of the nature of man, what is at stake in pursuing utopia? I think that would be a. a I can't recommend a book uh, more highly than that one in 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 instigating, you know, my transformation. Um, the book that's meant the most to me in critiquing the modern age, you know, and, and you know anything from the birth of the Enlightenment would be Richard Weaver's ideas have consequences, um, but that's you know that's more of a, a you know a meta critique of you know the meta history you know the historical development goes back and finds our Western fault in the middle of the you know 13th century, so you know the, he he finds problems way back then. So Richard Weaver's ideas have consequences. Um, the other person I would mention is. All of Paul Gottfried's books. I mean, he's he's been. I, I don't think anyone shaped my mind more than Paul Gottfried. His multiculturalism and the politics of guilt was way before its time in identifying what was coming with the left totalitarianism. Um, his book on the post post Marxist left that what we're experiencing now is not classical economic Marxism coming for us. Uh, I think economic Marxism pro proved itself to be a failure, and the Marxists admitted that. And so therefore they took the same rhetoric, the same class oppression, the same victimology as an approach to world history and um, made it into a cultural phenomenon instead of an economic phenomenon. So that's a strange death of Marxism. So anything by Paul Gottfried, there's a little book. Uh, another person is James Burnham. Now, James Burnham's books are kind of hard to get, especially his Machiavellian's book. Um, I, I've been influenced by the Machiavellians by James Burnham and also his um, Suicide of the West and his Managerial Revolution. But instead of getting all those and spending a thousand dollars, there's a little there's a little book by Sam Francis that basically summarizes each of James Burnham's um, major contributions. It's called Power in History. It's probably like 150 pages by Sam Francis. Uh, I think I got it for twenty or thirty dollars. Um, I highly recommend that book because it gives you a basically a crash course of James Burnham. Um, and James Burnham is one of the most influential, um, you know, political scientists to Paul Gottfried uh, as well. So I would say James Burnham, Paul Gottfried, Richard Weaver. Um, and then I would I mean, it, it, unfortunately, um, Paul Gottfried's summary book of Carl Schmitt, this one right here, I've read a couple of times. It's it's pretty expensive, but it's a great introductory to. Uh, Carl Schmitt, who was a critic of liberalism and kind of foresaw that liberalism did not have the tools within its arsenal to prevent its own takeover, you know, and that was the same case made by Antonio Gramsci and people like that. So I hope that gives um, I hope that gives a good a good starting point. No, that's a fantastic list. And uh, yeah, we'll make that we'll try and get that out. So uh, with this video, you also just have the list of books and some Amazon links as well. Well, CJ, thank you so much for joining us. This was just fantastic. And I think that it is very revealing uh, for those who are listening who may be you know, baby boomers or over the age of 50. 
But what I have seen more and more commonly is that Americans uh, of a you know conservative stripe or even libertarian are taking this trajectory. The young under 40, under 45. And uh, it does give me a lot of hope because in all of our experience, what I've seen is the points that CJ is making are the only ones that work to confront the cultural Marxism and the ideological rot that we're up against. So CJ, thank you very much for this. Thank you for you know, just sharing uh, your, not just your thoughts, but uh, your, your journey, your, uh, you know, life path or something. Yeah, like that. Right. So, well, thank you, CJ. And uh, the only thing I would leave up to is that if you are not a subscriber for Chronicles and you want to read pieces like CJ's piece up from libertarianism or read Paul Gottfried, and Paul Gottfried is our editor-in-chief, then you need to subscribe to Chronicles. Just go to our website, Charlemagne Institute, or chroniclesmagazine.org, or even Intellectual Takeout, and you'll see links there to be a member of our organization, just $5 a month, and you'll get fantastic uh, content and a magazine and a whole lot of other things. So hopefully you join us. Thank you.